Masechet Kiddushin, Daf Yod Bet. Yesterday we talked about Bet Shammai and the Dinar. Today we're going to talk about Bet Hilel and how much is a Peruta? What if it fluctuates uh, compared to other currencies? Also, what if I use something that is not worth a Peruta here, but is worth a Peruta somewhere else or at a different time? So let's go. Bet Hilel Omerim Bifruta. Sabah Rav Yosef Lemamar Peruta Kol Dehu. Rav Yosef was of the opinion, or he thought to say that, Peruta is dependent only upon itself. Abaye, however, rejected this um, because there's a Braita that says, How much is a Peruta? You don't, uh, Peruta is not valuable in and of itself, but rather it's only its value is dependent on a different coin on the Isara Italki. It's one eighth of the Isar. And generally, the smaller the denomination, if it's something's made out of like copper and provincial, then that will fluctuate more than something that's an official coin or a higher denomination made out of silver or gold. And so according to uh, this Baraita, uh, we see that the Peruta is defined based on this larger denomination, such that you can have sometimes a Peruta coin, but if the Peruta is weak, then the Peruta will be worth less than a Peruta. <laughs> Meaning, how could that be? Um, the Peruta will be worth less than what the, the Peruta that Hillel had in mind. When Hillel said a Peruta, he meant a certain amount of buying power, and it's that buying power that is important, has to be an eighth of an Isad, and therefore if the Peruta gets weaker or stronger, uh, so if it's if it's weaker, then it won't be. Then it's not usable. Okay, so that's Abaye that says it's fluc- it fluctuates. Rav Yosef, however, thought to say that it's independent. Uh, with your peru, you, you value a peruta just based on itself. It's kind of like sometimes people in Israel have to decide if they're going to get paid in shekels or in dollars. If you get, if you get paid in shekels, then whether the shekel is weak or strong, you get the same amount. If you get paid in dollars and just convert it to shekels, then you get a different amount uh, depending on whether it's weak or strong. So that's the two opinions here. Now, now we want to try to defend Rav Yosef and uh, say that that Braita was only telling you what the original amount of a Peruta was in relation to an Isar way back at the time of the original giving of the Torah, at the time of Moshe. Um, but nowadays, uh, whatever the Peruta is, it is. Uh, it's dependent on itself, right? The, 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 that Braita was giving you the one original uh, ratio, but nowadays, after that, it doesn't matter what the ratio is. You just give a Peruta no matter whether it's weak or strong. So if you say that, we have a problem. We see that there are different times and different people had different ratios. Um, because uh, Rabbi Simai says, in his generation, this is from R- R- Rav Dimi. Rav Dimi comes from Eretz Yisrael, is one of the Nechotae. And he said, in the time of uh, Rabbi Simai, in his generation, a peruta was one-eighth of an Italian Isar. And when the Ravin came from Eretz Yisrael, he said, in a different generation of these three rabbis, they estimated that a peruta was one-sixth of an Italian Isar. So you see that in different generations, a peruta is defined in relation to an Isar. So it's not an independent value, it's a fluctuating value. Uh, so what, Rav Yosef, what, what, what will you say about that? How can you defend yourself? Rav Yosef says, look, I have a proof from the following Baraita. The context of the Baraita is that uh, regarding Me'ila, if someone steals and takes uses something from the Beit HaMikdash, even if it's worth only one Peruta, they have to bring a Korban, and the Korban is worth two Sela'im. So look how by benefiting just for a tiny bit, one has to pay a lot. Um, so in the course of the Braita, it gives a ratio and says, how many, look how many perutot are in two sela'im, more than more than 2,000. Now, actually, if you calculate it according to the standard ratio that we just had, like one-eighth of an Italian Isar, 
it ends up being much less. Therefore, Rav Yosef argues, a peruta is a peruta. It's, we use that independent value, no matter what its ratio is. And sometimes it will be an eighth, sometimes it will be a sixth of an Italian isad. And sometimes, as in the case of this paraita, the peruta is very weak. Right, because more than 2,000 pidutot to make up two sela'im. And nevertheless, if someone would steal uh, a piduta's worth, even though the piduta is worth very is worth very little, they have violated me'ila. So you prove from here that a piduta is a piduta is a piduta, and it doesn't matter whether it's strong or weak, even if it's less than that ratio that it used to be in the time of Moshe or any other time. Uh, you could just use a piduta coin. All right, so that's. A good proof for Rav Yosef. Uh, but an elder said, I have a different version of the Paraita. It doesn't say that's more than 2,000, it says it's almost 2,000. So that's a bit less. But still, that doesn't really answer the question. Sof, sof, alfa, vechamesh me out latin vishitahu de havian. If you do the calculation, you'll find that there's only 1,536 pirutot in Tusela, according to the standard conversion rate of one-eighth of an Isar. Uh, so you see that this is actually nowhere close to 2,000. So you, even changing the words to almost 2,000 is not going to help. But we answer, No, since it passed the half half of the second thousand, in other words, once it's, uh, if you want to right round to the nearest thousand, then 1536 is past 500, so we'll round it up to 2,000. And so it still could be, according to the girsa of that elder, that it's almost 2,000. It's, uh, it's a bit far from 2,000, but you can still call that rounded up, uh, rounded up to 2,000. And therefore, it could actually be that that Benaita is assuming the standard rate that we uh, that uh, of one eighth of an isar, and it's it's maybe it's exaggerating a little to point out that look even for stealing just one peruta you're going to have to pay like 2,000 times, almost 2,000 times more, which turns into even more than 2,000 times the amount uh, originally. And so we can read it like that. And in that reading, the, uh, the value of the piruta is in fact dependent on the, its conversion ratio to other currencies. Okay, so that concludes that machloket, Rav Yosef saying that uh, you can use a piruta for kiddushin, even if the piruta is weaker than uh, an eighth of an isad, no matter what, how, no matter how weak it is, if you have a piruta coin, you can use it. Whereas the other sages said um, the uh, piruta is a standard buying amount, uh, a buy, has a standard buying power um, that's defined in ratio to other higher currencies. And if a piruta is weak, then you couldn't use a piruta coin. A piruta might not be worth a piruta. Gufa. Now we're going to go more into this tradition that we had from the two sages that came from Eretz Yisrael. Rav Dimi said in the, in the generation of Rav Simai, a peruta was one-eighth of an isar. As opposed to Rav Dimi, Ravin said that in the generation of these three sages, it's one-sixth of an Italian Isad. So Abaye suggested to Rav Dimi when he came to Bavel and met Abaye um, and told him this, uh, this tradition. Uh, Rav Dimi is the one that said the first one. That's one eighth. He says, it seems that you and Rabin are arguing along the same lines as the following two Tanaim in this Baraita de Tanya. Uh, so the, the, this Tanakama says uh, that the Peruta that the sages talk about is one-eighth of an Italian Isar. And then the Beraita continues and, and gives all the conversion rates for the different denominations and says six Ma'ot of Kesef is one Dinar and uh, each Ma'a is two Pinjon, each, two, each Pinjon is two Isarin. Okay, we don't, we don't need that information for our calculation, but we need the one, following ones. In Isar is Shne Mus Misin, Masma Shne Kon Tron Kin, Kon 
ان تراغن شنه شته پروتات نمسا پروتا حد مشمنا بي سارا ايتالكي if you just take the last three and the side is two مسمسين and then multiply that by another two to get to the contractin um, and then you uh, multiply by another two to get to the perutot so that's uh, two uh, to the third power which is eight so that's the calculation of eight so you see that Tanakama would follow Rav Dimi who says one out of eight uh, whereas Rabban Shimon Gamliel Lomesh Shilosha had resin lema'a, shene henesin lehandres, shene shemanin lehenets, shete perutot leshamin, nimsa peruta had mishisha bisarai talki. Rashbag, however, has a different conversion rate, and he calculates that a peruta is one out of six, one six of any of an Italian isar. So it looks like Rashbag follows the uh, second opinion of Rabin, right? So lema de mor amar ketana. Kama. Why don't we say that Rav Dimi follows Tanakama? But Ravinda, Mar Karaban Shimon Ben Gamliel. That seems to make sense. Uh, however, Amar Le Rav Dimi, Rav Dimi says back to Abaye, no, not true. We don't want to. Uh, we don't want one person to be only like Ravin to be only like a minority opinion. Even Rav Dimi is going to uh, uh, support, defend his colleague, and he says both of us Ben Didi Ben Ravin Ali Bad Tanakama. We can both agree with Tanakama. Vela Kashia. How the Ayakur Isare? How does all Isare? We thought we were talking about different times when sometimes the Isar became stronger and sometimes it was weaker. When it became stronger, then there was 24 Isarim in a Zuz. So since that was stronger, so that would be the uh, that would mean that the Peruta is one out of eight uh, isar italkis ha dezol kum te latin utren bezuza but sometimes when the isar italki becomes weak so uh, such that there's 30 Two uh, Italian isars in one zoos, which, which is one dinar. So since that, since it's weak, um, that would uh, account for the peruta being one eighth of an Italian isar. Okay, now Amar Shemuel kidesha bitmara afilo omed kur temarim bedinar mekudeshet pashin an shema shave peruta bemadai. Shemuel teaches that if a man does kidushin to a woman with a date, hadem mekudeshet with this temara gives her a date, um, then even if a cord, a, a big uh, measurement of dates is worth one dinar, that would translate into one single date being worth less than a peruta, still mikudeshet. Why? It's less than a peruta. Because we are concerned maybe it's not worth a peruta here, but maybe it is worth a peruta in Madai. So, uh, since it might be worth a Madai, she is Mikudeshet. Now we ask about this. Hold on. Hilel says you can use a peruta or something worth a peruta. If it's less than a, worth less than a peruta, then a nam Mikudeshet. How come Shemuel says Mikudeshet? La Kasha, Habikidushe Vadai, Habikidushe Safek. Bet Hilel was talking about. Out, to be definitely mikudeshet, you have to have something that's definitely worth a shave peruta. When Shemuel said, said mikudeshet, he didn't mean for sure mikudeshet, because he said here, chayshinan. What he means is safek mikudeshet, right? We're not sure if this kiddushin is good or not, um, so that if the guy really wants to marry her, he should do kiddushin again. And if not, he's gonna, he, should, he has to give her a get. If, she doesn't go, if, she, if he doesn't do that and she goes and marries somebody else, we're going to have big problems because we don't know if she married to the first guy or married to the second guy. So, Shemuel meant Mikudeshet Misafek. Good. Now we have a few stories. Uh, a certain guy, he said he took a bundle of rags and went to his girlfriend and said, with this bundle of rags. All right, what kind of guy does that? This guy. And now the case goes uh, to Rav Shim as he was sitting before Rav, and to figure out what to do in this case. And they said, if it's worth a peruta, this bundle of rags, then it's good. It's, it's good kiddushin. And if not, it's not good kiddushin. Okay. Now we ask, wait a second, even if it's not worth a shave peruta here, right, would you, would you say, no, it's not, it's not kiddushin, it's for sure not kiddushin, Shemuel said, even if it's not worth a peruta here, it could be that it's worth a peruta somewhere else, and so we should say, Mikudeshet Misafek. 
And the answer is, La Kashya Habikidusha Vadai, Habikidusha Safek. Indeed, when they said, is if, if it's worth a piduta, yes. So yeah, yeah, if, if it's definitely worth a piduta, they go, you know, they go to the marketplace. How much is this bear, this um, uh, 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 a bundle of rags worth? And they assess it to be a piduta. Then for sure, she is mikudeshit. If it's not worth a piruta, then um, we can't say that she is definitely not mikudeshet. When they said yes and no over here, they were talking about either she's definitely mikudeshet or she's not definitely mikudeshet. But Shemuel was talking about safek. And so you're right, indeed, we, have, we can reconcile these, uh, this um, statement with Shemuel by saying that even if there are, is, is less than a piruta in this bundle of rags here, maybe there's some other place where you know, there's, uh, rags are um, rare and uh, go for a higher price, and so it would be a sefek. Another story. We're going to have a lot of discussion about this case of a man who gives a woman this blue marble stone. It's like a semi-precious uh, stone. And uh, I guess it seemed like a nice stone to give her, but it was just a small piece of a stone. And so now it goes to Rav Chista to figure out, is this worth a peduta or not? And he said, Is it, If it is worth a peduta, then it's mikudeshet. If not, it's, no, she's not mikudeshet. It sounds like not mikudeshet at all. Uh, she can go marry somebody else. And we ask, Wait, even if it's not worth a peduta, really, are you going to say she can go free and marry a second? Second guy, Valma Shemuel Haishina and Shemuel said, We have to worry, maybe it's not worth a peruta here, but it could be worth a peruta somewhere else. And this time, we don't uh, answer like we did before, that he was only talking about Kiddush Safek. Instead, we answered, Rav Chistad, La Sabar Le De Shemuel. They're both Amoraim. Rav Chistad is later than Shemuel, but still, he can uh, disagree. And he says, I don't, I don't uh, agree with Shemuel. Uh, uh, just because it's worth a peruta, maybe somewhere else, uh, go find somewhere in the world where you can get a peruta for this. Doesn't matter. Over here, it's not worth a peruta, and therefore, they are not married at all. So, Rav Chista said, go ahead, marry anyone you want, have a good life, and that's what she did. Now, here's the problem. Amra le imeh, the mother of this, of the first guy who originally gave her this blue stone, she wanted to defend her son and say that, yeah, this is Kiddushin works, and this, uh, this, uh, uh, bride belongs to my son. And she says, on that day, the market price for this blue stone, it was worth a peruta on the day that he gave it to her. Now now you're looking at it a few days later, and now the price went down, but on that day, it was. Rav Chisar rejects her claim and said, it's not in your power to make her forbidden to the next guy. Right? You can't come along and say uh, that it used to be, well, on that day it was worth a peruta and therefore she's mikudesha to my son because that will have a, con- a negative consequence to her, that to the bride, that she then will be prohibited to the second guy. And so Rav Chista says, I'm going to look at how much it is worth now. That's all I, that's, you know, I, all I have is what I have in front of me. And um, and therefore, in my current assessment, it's not worth a peruta. I allow her to go free. Amazing. Now, lav haynu di hudi to debi to derbi haya tavat le saar leda amra le amra di em kibel bech avuch kidushe kizutart. Now, if you're wondering, how could Rav Chista go and just reject uh, this testimony of the mother who said it was worth a peruta? He just ignores her testimony? He says, yeah, he has a precedent. Uh, Rav Chista quotes a precedent from the daughter of Rabbi Chia, um, sorry, the wife of Rabbi Chia, who had, uh, was, had terrible pains during childbirth. And so, so therefore, she wanted to end her marriage to Rabbi Chia so she wouldn't become pregnant again and suffer through that terrible pain. So she goes and, and tells her husband, the Rabbi Chia, my mother told me that, uh, told me as follows, your father accepted Kiddushin on your behalf when you were young, meaning you were already Mikudeshe to some other guy, and therefore you are not married to the Bichia. And if that would be true, then, uh, then the Bichia's marriage to her, that Kiddushin was null and void, and she's not married to him at all, and she could just walk away from the marriage. 
Um, evidently, uh, she may, maybe she asked before for a get, but uh, Rabbi Chia would not want to um, give her a get. Um, so she wants to try to get out of it by saying she was already mikudeshet. But Rabbi Chia rejected her claim and said, it's not in your mother's power um, uh, to prohibit you to me, right? Based on her, her testimony, because she wants to, to save you for, uh, from this uh, pain or whatever. Um, and and uh, so you, uh, maybe she just made up this claim. Uh, so you can't rely on such a claim to make someone prohibited. And that's the precedent that Avchista is using to say here too, I'm not going to rely on the mother who said that that day on the marketplace this blue stone was worth a peruta. Maybe, maybe not, but it's not in her power to say so. I'm going to assess it um, as it is now in front of me. Wait a second, the, uh, the rabbis tell Rav Chista, how come you say that we don't trust this mother? Aren't there witnesses in, an, in a faraway place called Edith? And they know that that day you had the value of Peruta. Why don't you just, you know, go summon those witnesses and they'll tell you uh, that in fact it was worth a Peruta. So Rav Chista answers, Hashtamiha lalit Kaman. says those witnesses are not here now, right? And la dayan ela That's a general principle. A judge can only assess based on what his eyes see with the evidence that's in front of him now. If there are t- if there are witnesses that on that day it was worth a peduta, then let them come. If they're here in the courthouse, I will listen to her testimony and it's worth a peduta. Then I'll say yes, she was married to that first guy. But the witnesses are not here, so don't tell me about witnesses that are somewhere far away. Rav Chista cites further proof for his stance. Once said about a case of a woman who came to court. She said, listen, I was taken captive, but I remained undefiled. They were not with me. Let's say, for example, she's married to a Kohen. If she's married to a Kohen, even if she was taken by force, raped, she would be prohibited to her to go back to him. But since she's the one that said in the first place that she was uh, taken captive, so so we should believe her to say that uh, she uh, she remained uh, 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 undefiled. She's okay. Now, in that case, there actually were witnesses that she was taken captive, but those witnesses were all the way far in the north. So, just because some witnesses far away, should we prohibit her? Uh, Rabbi Hanina said, no. If there are witnesses here that said she was taken captive, then we would have a problem believing her to say that she was, uh, that she was not taken. Um, uh, but if the witnesses are far away, they're not in court, then we can ignore them. So that's another proof that, yes, we can ignore witnesses who are not here, uh, or in this case, the mother who has interest um, in defending her son, we say, well, it's not up to you. It's not in your power to testify that it was worth peruta on that day. Uh, right now, it's not worth a peruta. So, Rav Chista allowed that woman to go ahead and go free. Now, Abaye Verava, La Sevida Lehu, Leha de Rav Chista. Abaye Verava disagreed with Rav Chista. I mekelu bishvuya, timinavela nafshaha, kabe shabai, nekel be'eshet ish. He said, it's one thing in the case of Rabbi Hanina that uh, the rabbis want to be lenient uh, uh, and to, to help her out. And furthermore, she can do something to in that situation to uh, be by appearing repulsive, right? She could make herself repulsive, act like she's crazy and disgusting so that her captors will, won't take her. Since it's somewhat in her power to resist, um, therefore we will believe her to say that she was not defiled. But regarding Eshet Ish, you can take this woman who maybe she accepted this rock that could have been Shaveh Peruta there's some some uh, ev- evidence that it was worth a shaver peruta. There's evidence somewhere else that it's uh, worth shaver peruta, and uh, she w- she would have no um, uh, uh, no ability to make it shaver peruta or not shaver peruta. She she wouldn't have ability to make it a marriage or not. Um, uh, and this a more serious uh, topic of eshet ish um, could, could lead to adultery, and the children could be mamzerim. So sorry, even though the bichani now is lenient in that case, we're not going to translate that leniency over to this case so they disagreed with Rav Chista's ruling. Now, There were descendants of that family, meaning that, that woman that if Rav Chista says it's worth, not worth a peruta from that original guy, she went and married a different guy. 
and had children. And there are descendants of that children in Surah, and the sages avoided them. The sages would not marry into that family because they suspected, perhaps, that the ch those children are mamzerim. Because if that blue stone was worth a shavea piruta, a shavea piruta um, on that day, then the children are mamzerim. The sages there in Suda, the reason that they were machmir is not because they followed Shemuel, who we saw at the beginning, who says, even if, Shemuel said, even if something is for sure not a peruta here, we suspect maybe it is worth a peruta somewhere else. Uh, we don't follow halakha. They, didn't, uh, they, they weren't worried about that. We don't follow halakha like that. But they were worried that on that very day, it was in that place, it was worth a, a peruta. And even though if there's no witnesses here that say so, there are witnesses somewhere else that say so. Um, therefore, um, uh, the, the sages in Suda later on um, held like Abaye and Rava and stayed away from that family. Next, a certain man, he did kiddushin with a woman with a myrtle branch in the marketplace. And so Rav Acha Barahuna sends a message to Rav Yosef, says, what should we do with this guy? Right, because uh, these myrtle branches were not worth a peruta. He says, well, you should do th two things. First of all, you should give him lashes in accordance with what Rav teaches and he she also needs to get accordance with Shemuel. Shemuel we saw already. Shemuel says even if the myrtle branch is definitely not worth a piruta here, it could be that there's some other place that the myrtle branches are rare and it is worth a piruta and therefore she is mikudeshet mi safek so she, uh, she is required to receive a get. And then she can go and marry somebody else. So that's one. Now, why should we uh, give the guy lashes? The Rav Mangid al Mekadesh Rav would give lashes to anyone who gets uh, uh, gets engaged in the marketplace. It's disrespectful. It's crude. There's people coming in and out, busy and dirty and smelly. And you're gonna go do that? Go do a nice, uh, you know, romantic engagement on uh, an ice skating rink, on a, on a boat, in the river, on the rooftop, right? Do something nice. You don't go in the middle of a marketplace. Now we can continue to learn that I would also give lashes to several other people that did things that were, were, were against the sages. As someone who does Kiddushin with Bi'ah, even though that's, uh, that's one of the three valid ways uh, to uh, do Kiddushin, and in some ways it's kind of like the most original, it's right there in the Pasuk, Uba'ala, uh, nevertheless, this is crude, unbecoming to uh, treat a woman this way and, uh, and uh, uh, get engaged to her through Bi'ah. Save Bi'ah later for the Nisu'in. And if someone does uh, does kiddushin without first making arrangements, in other words, first discuss the marriage, talk about it with the family, and how you're going to set up the marriage, and what, how much you're going to bring, and how much the other one's going to bring, and get everybody's consent. Right? You're just going to go elope without talking to anybody. Go to Vegas and uh, do kiddushin. It's not proper to do it that way. It has to be done in the proper protocol. If a man goes. Uh, uh, sends his wife a get, and then he goes and nullifies the get in front of witnesses uh, or in front of a bedin. So this causes trouble because she will receive the get and think it's good, even though he undid it. We saw that um, the, the rabbis uh, were against this back in Masechet Gitin. Valdemasar Moda'a, that was one of the Tikkun Olam uh, um, items. Valdemasar Moda'a Agita. Also, if a husband, before he gives the get, he goes to a couple of witnesses, listen, the get that I'm going to give tomorrow, I'm do, uh, it's under duress, and I don't mean it. And so then the next day, he goes and gives her a get. She thinks it's okay, and she'll go and get, me, get remarried. Turns out, he gave this moda'a, making it an uh, invalid get, and so she was never free to marry, and her, those children will be mamzerim. So anyone who tries to do that, we give him lashes. If the uh, betin sends a messenger to someone to, to tell them to do something, and that guy gives the, bet, gives the messenger a hard time, we come and we give him lashes because the messenger represents the betin. If he disrespects the messenger, he is disrespecting, disrespecting the court itself. And anyone who has is excommunicated for more than 30 days, and he doesn't come and do something about it. 
it, right? You got a, a writ of excommunication. Come, repent, tell the, tell the sages this is what happened. I won't do it anymore, right? You don't care that you've been excommunicated. So then you deserve lashes too. Val Hatana de Dayer Bebe Hamu. And a son-in-law who lives in his father-in-law's house. Uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, Rambam says it's uh, not proper that the this uh, the the son-in-law is going to come and uh, be with his uh, with the father's daughter right there in his own house. So that's not proper. Uh, but the dayer in halifla. But that's only if he lives there permanently. If he's just passing by, is there once in a while? That's okay. I should note that I record this while I'm living in my father-in-law's house, but not permanently. Right? It's only for a few weeks. Hold on, we have a story of this a certain groom that he just passed by the house of his father-in-law and Rav Sheshat whipped him. He didn't even go in, he didn't sleep there, he was just passing by and they whipped him. But you just said that if it's just uh, just passing by, then it's okay. And the answer is, No, in that case, they were suspicious about him that he was passing by because he was flirting with his mother-in-law. And so that's why he deserved whipping even to just for just passing by. That guy was a, just a no-good lowlife. Uh, but generally, we don't worry about that. Um, Rashi, in this original thing, says that the reason why a son-in-law can't live his father-in-law is because we are worried about that incest. Um, uh, Rashi's taking that interpretation from the end of the story here. But interestingly, because they say that's the reason, Tosafot then later say, well, that's not common, that, 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 that doesn't happen, and therefore it's permitted. So because they give that as the reason, which is kind of extreme, and that doesn't happen, so then it'll be permitted, uh, whereas uh, others uh, interpret the original law not in conjunction with this crazy uh, guy who gets, who gets lashes at the end, uh, but rather say either like Rambam, because it's not nice to be with someone's daughter in his own house, or because this is talking about a case where it was actually before uh, marriage, um, before the marriage was consummated, and so then, uh, then um, it's also not proper to be living there. The rabbis in Naharada say, no, no, Rav would not uh, give lashes to all of those people, except the one that's really bad is someone that does Kiddushin through Bi'ah, Without a prior arrangement, right? You just, uh, uh, you know, just me- meets uh, this this girl without meeting her fam- her family, her parents, without them uh, making an arrangement. The word shiduch seems to come from the word to appease, uh, to uh, to make uh, to make peace. Um, and um, make sure everybody's happy and on the same page. So if you did that first and uh, everybody's, you know, uh, uh, has all the arrangements for the marriage are made and all the families are in agreement, then you make Kaddish baby, uh, he wouldn't give, be, uh, he wouldn't give lashes. Um, but just to do, uh, just uh, take her with bia without any any shiduchim uh, uh, that deserves lashes. That's one version. The other version says even if you did shiduchim, nevertheless, that's like pepiri suta. It's still even if they the families all agreed and you uh, everybody's good with this marriage and all the terms are set forth nevertheless uh, bias should be the consummation of the marriage later kiddushin it's not proper to do to use bia for kiddushin at all in any case Finally, we discuss, we discuss one more similar story. Another guy who betrothed a woman with a mat of myrtle branches. So there's some myrtle branches, which are nice, they smell nice, and so you know, symbolically a nice thing to use, um, and they're wrapped up in a mat. So we have the scene here. We have the the guy. We have the girl, and he is giving her adet mikudesh shetli with this uh, with these hadasim, and she takes it. And then there's people standing by uh, watching, and they say, "Hold on, the myrtle branches are not worth a peruta." And the guy said, "All right, I know you're right. Um, let her be mikudeshet uh, with the four zoos that are wrapped up in the mat." They were hidden in the mat that he also had given her. She had taken it, and then she was quiet. So the initial taking of it, when he said, you are mikudeshit with the myrtles, that shows her indication that she agrees to be 
Mekodeshit with myrtles. The problem is that that's invalid because the myrtles were uh, less than a peruta. And then he, after she already has the mat in her hands, then he says, "All right, you know what? Be mekodeshit with the coins that you already have in your hands that are that are hidden in the mat." So is this a good kiddushin or not? Amarava hava shetikuta de la harmatan maot vecho shetikuta de la harmatan maot lav kelum hi. Rava said it's no good because this is silence after the money is already given. And any time you have, she responds with silence when she already has something in her hands, then that is no good. See, if she has it in her hands already and he says, be mikudeshit with what I just gave you and she says yes, Okay, fine. That's okay. She said yes. Or if he gives her, if he says, be mikudeshit with this uh, ring and gives it to her and she's silent, that's fine. As long as she takes the ring and doesn't throw it back at him um, or doesn't say no, so then that's fine. That's the usual case that happens in, uh, in almost every wedding nowadays. The woman does not say anything. She just accepts the ring. So as long as he says it first, and then gives it to her and she takes it and she doesn't say anything, then that's an acceptable Kiddushin. What you can't do is give her something first and then say, oh, that, by the way, is your Kiddushin. And then she says nothing. Well, I don't know. She didn't do an act um, to accept it because she already had it in her hands and she didn't say yes. So how do we know what she means? But, but if she if she agreed to it and therefore it's no good. That is Rava's stance. Amar Rava. Mina amina la de tanya. Rava says I have a proof from the following Braita. Amala uh, kinsi se la zo be picadon. A man tells a woman, can you hold on to this hundred dollars for me? Just uh, watch it for me. And then uh, later on, after she already has it in her hands, she's watching it for him uh, as a deposit. Then he says, you know what? I want you to be mikudesh to me with that hundred dollars that you already have. Now, what's the law? Bishad matan ma'ot mikudesh If he says this, at the time that he gives it over, then that's fine, right? Um, he has the hundred dollars. He says, I, mean, "I want you to hold this for me." You know what? I want you to make kodesh it to me, and he gives it over, and she accepts it. That's fine. La har matan maot rasa mikudeshet lo rasta ena mikudeshet. But if he already gave it to her and said, "Here, can you wash this for me?" She already has it in her hands, and then later after that, he says, "Be mikudeshet." So if she is willing then it's good Kiddushin. If she's not willing, it's not a good Kiddushin. We have to define this term. What do you mean willing? If by willing it means when she says explicitly yes, and not willing means she says explicitly no. So that would mean in the second case here, when she already had the item in her hands, it depends on her saying yes or saying no. But that was is contrast with the resha, which is bishat matan ma'ot. If a, if he says it, he says bimikudeshet at the time that he's giving it. Um, then what? It doesn't matter if she says yes or no. That isn't true. Mekalal the resha ki amra lo na mehavu kiddushin. You'd mean to tell me in the resha when he does the usual. Uh, uh, ceremony, and he says, "Be mikudeshet with this hundred dollars," and gives it to her, and she says, "No." You're going to tell me that is mikudeshet? So it can't that can't be? If she says no, no is no, and uh, therefore um, it can't be that shelo birshut miloratsta doesn't mean that she said no. All right, amai ha ha kamra la. If she says no, then the kiddushin is no good. Ela la vrasta damra in lorasta di ishtika mishtika. Rather, we have to explain that that in the sefa, uh, willing means just she said yes. Not willing means she was quiet and didn't say anything at all. Ushma mina shetika la har matan maot lav kelum vela kelum hu. So we learn from this that any time that she is quiet after she already received the money, that is considered nothing. So by doing having it quiet, then we can explain the resha and the sefa and the resha that he's saying. Be mikudesh to me, and then he gives her the money. And if she is quiet, that's good kiddushin. That's a standard ceremony. If she says no, then it's not a good kiddushin. Whereas in the sefa, where first he gives her the money and says, "Here, we'll just watch this for me as a pikadon," and then afterwards he says, "You know what? Make that kiddushin." If she is 
uh, if she is quiet in that case, right? So that means if she, if she says yes, then that's fine. She's indicating her agreement by saying so. Lodasta means if she's quiet, because we just proved that lodasta in Odesha has to mean if she doesn't say anything at all, if it doesn't say anything at all, then it's good. Um, so in the Sefa also means if she says, if she's quiet, um, then it's no good. Why is it no good? Because she already received the money. And then he says the proposal formula, and she didn't indicate by saying yes that she's agreement. She didn't indicate that she's in agreement by taking it because she already has it in her possession. So anytime she's uh, quiet after receiving the item, it is not a good kiddushin. That's the best proof from this baraita. All right, pretty good proof. Okay, so now uh, we challenge it. So in Pumnahara, they had to challenge in the name of Rav Huna Bere de Rav Yehoshua. And they said, Rava, is, are these two cases equivalent? They're not. So in the case of the Pikadon, that Braita that you brought, um, so he gives it to her at first as a deposit. Once she accepts it as a deposit, now she's responsible for it. If she should go and break it on purpose, she will have to pay for it. So uh, in that case, she's thinking to herself when, when the guy says, you know what, be mikudesh to me with that. It's already in your hands. So she, let's say she wants to reject it. Now, if she throws it back at him, she's afraid maybe this item will break. And then she'll have to pay for it. So that's why she's not going to throw it back at him. So she's, her being quiet in that case it may, is, is not, it means that then the Kiddushin is not good, right? Because we wouldn't expect her to throw it back at him because then she'll be responsible. So it makes sense over there to say that her being quiet after she already has it in her hands is not considered consent and there's no Kiddushin. But that's different from this. But in our case, um, where the guy gave the myrtle branch, and then he said, oh, you know what? Be mikudeshit with the four coins that are wrapped up in the mat. He gave her the myrtle branch initially as kidushin, not as a deposit. So she never accepted upon herself that she would be responsible for this. And therefore, when he says, you know what, be uh, do a, be with the four zoos that's already in your hands, if she did not want it, she would throw it back at him. She would not be worried that she's going to have to pay in case it breaks or, you know, gets lost or falls down the mountain or whatever, because she never accepted responsibility for it in the first place. So the fact that she did not throw it back at him and just sat there quietly and didn't do anything shows that she is willing to be married in that way. Um, so that's the challenge of Rav Huna, Bered Rav Yoshua, against Rava. Rava, you have no proof from this, but Aita, um, that Shetika is Kehoda'a when she already has an item. Parikh Rav Achai, Atukil Huna She, Dina Gemire, Rav Achai in turn challenges that challenge of Rav Huna, Bered Rav Yoshua. He says, Are all women so learned in Halacha? There are there are some women that learned that for me. There are some women that are that are learned even back then. There were there were some learned women, but most are not so um, are not so knowledgeable in the details of halacha to know the difference between something that's given as a as a pikadon in which someone takes responsibility and then if they break it they'll have to pay for it. Whereas if they're given to, give, it's given to them as kiddushin just as a gift and then they won't be responsible. You think the woman's making all those calculations, right? Most people don't know. These, all, all these distinctions that would ma make a difference. So we can't uh, analyze psychologically the fact that she's sitting there and doing nothing. In the case of Picadon, that means uh, she really rejects it, but she doesn't want to throw it because then she'll be responsible. But with Kiddushin, if she was rejecting it, she would throw it because she's not responsible. We can't assume that people know all those the legal details. Likely, most people would think even the, in the case of Kiddushin with the myrtles, uh, she'll think that, oh, if I throw it back at him and it breaks, I'm going to be responsible. So you know what? I better not throw it. Uh, so in both cases, they are equivalent, and therefore that it supports Rava. We can learn one from the other. And uh, um, uh, just like in the case of Picadon, she would be afraid to throw it back. And so therefore her sitting there saying nothing means uh, does not mean that she can uh, she, uh, she consents. So too in the case of the myrtle, her sitting there doing nothing 
being quiet uh, does not mean that she consents, and therefore it's not a, kid, kid, a good kiddushin. So finally, we want to know uh, what is the halacha. Rav Rav asks Ravina. says, listen, we have not heard this challenge of Rav Huna Bered Rav Yoshua. We never heard the challenge at all. So therefore, we can follow Rav and say that there's no Kiddushin here. But you, you did hear this challenge of Rav Huna Bered Rav Yoshua, Bered Rav Yoshua. So even though you have a possible answer, but because this is a serious challenge, so you should be concerned that maybe it's a good Kiddushin um, because um, maybe there is a difference between Pikadon, where she would not want to throw it back, and Kiddushin, where she would throw it back if she was rejecting it and she didn't reject it. So maybe that does mean that she agrees to it. Or maybe not. So therefore we have to be, um, uh, we have to assume that it's a good kiddushin mi safek. I, mean, I don't have to worry about it, but you did hear, hear this tradition of Yoshua, and therefore you should be machmir. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.